we're in ranch country and we're in a very isolated um, area. I'm married to a rancher and he's the fourth generation to live on that ranch. Before there was a grocery store here, people drove a minimum of 42 miles to a grocery store. When I moved to town, we had been without a grocery store for 10 years. When you're in rural America, sometimes it is hard to survive, but this community has just always made the stand that we will be here, we will survive, we will keep our bank, we will keep our school. Their feeling is that if a community is going to stay alive, it has to have three things, a school, a store, and a bank, and, and the store kind of rounded out um, that feeling. We've had teachers apply to work here, and when they saw there was no grocery store, they just went away. So it's always been in the back of everybody's mind that it'd be nice to have the grocery store again. It actually started as a brainstorming session, I understand, in the school. The topic was, we have a really good school system, but we're losing students. And we got to visiting and Stacy said, well, she had people that lived out her neighborhood that really would like to come to this school, but it didn't make sense for them to come here and then have to turn around after school and drive to another town, another time zone to get their groceries. And so Stacy and I just laughed, and I said, well, you know, she said, we're just going to have to build the grocery store, I guess. And we laughed and looked at each other and said, yeah, I think we're going to have to build the grocery store. When we talked about other grocery stores being in Cody, I think, I think, I don't think a real grocery store could survive. I think the profit margin is too slim. The store couldn't survive if there wasn't a lot of what I would call volunteer labor. During the day, they don't get paid. It's a class. It's a work-based learning class. But in the evenings, after school, weekends, summers, then we pay them. We were invited to go speak at a, at a conference, and when I looked at the flyer, it said Social Enterprise Conference, and I thought, I don't even know what Social Enterprise is. I don't know why we're going, but okay, they want to hear our story, we'll tell our story. So I listened to the keynote speaker, and I actually got goosebumps. A social enterprise is a business whose primary purpose is the common good. Our primary purpose is to serve our community and to educate our students. And when you look at the social enterprise model, it's a government agency, the school, and a nonprofit, and then creating a business, which is the Circle C Market. Nobody is making money on this store. It's going into an account to keep the store going. Adults don't necessarily trust kids. I'm thinking of a nice way to put this. And so one of the real battles um, first coming here was to, to convince people to let this be truly a student-run store. It was kind of billed as that, but then when you know you come right down to it and say, okay, we've got a, you know, a store with a significant amount of inventory in it, it's important for the community, are we really sure that we want to turn it over to students? The students were involved with every aspect of building this store. I learned lots of different business skills and skills of working with people and working with other businesses. My role at the store is bank reconciliation. I have learned QuickBooks already and I want to be a CPA when I get older. It's just really helped me. We have students that clean. I have students that are we're showing them how to do the maintenance. One student who is in charge of uh, the produce, students do all the pricing, all the ordering. They stock, they run the cash register. We make decisions based on money, $50,000, $100,000, which is something I never thought I'd ever be part of. And then it has really taught many of them to deal with people in general. I was terrified of talking on the phone until I started helping with the grocery store. And you know, it just really gets you out of your comfort zone and helps teach you life skills that you'll need. I used to be really shy and everything and never really did public speaking or interviews like this. I'm just a lot better around people, I think, solving problems with people without offending them. If I could tell every high school kid in America something, I would say, you're capable of so much more than you think you are. 
it just, you just have to grab the bull by the horns. Never to take the first no, because they were told a lot of no's, and they had to push through a lot of things to get this. Dream bigger than you're dreaming. I'm a big dreamer. I've always have been, ever since I was little. Big dreams. And I think that's a key to starting anywhere. Like, we did it in Cody, Nebraska. I think you can do it just about anywhere you want to. issue about losing your supermarket actually is a deeper issue about justice for many people. If you don't have a place to buy healthy food, it makes you feel like you've been forgotten. I strongly believe in ideas and the power of them. Here's an idea that I talked about that wound up going to the White House and became a part of national policy. Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative um, started really out of something simple called uh, a farmer's market. Come winter, the farmer's market was going to close and a number of residents started talking about the fact that they didn't have supermarkets nearby and it really prompted more deep thought on the part of the food trust as to why these supermarkets weren't there anymore. Where did they go? Not only did we look at where the supermarkets were and where the people were, but eventually we looked at where the disease rates were the highest. So where are people suffering from the highest rates of what we call diet-related disease? When you isolated that, where disease was highest and where uh, people were of lowest income and where there were no supermarkets, that's really where we started um, to get people interested in having a focused conversation. A state representative by the name of uh, Dwight Evans, he himself had been a resident grown up in Philadelphia and could relate to this problem. He could reflect on the fact that it did seem like there were quite a few um, areas that were missing supermarkets that should have them. Then he started to look at this issue as a state, because as a state representative, he can't just be responsible for you know fixing the ills of Philadelphia, he's really responsible for helping people across the state. As the chairman of the Appropriation Committee, um, you have an awful lot of influence and power. When we were at the negotiating table, this was my priority. Uh, and it was something that I felt very strongly about first. And secondly, I chose not to do this in legislation. It was a line item that I used in the state's budget as a way to meet the objective. It was uh, 10 million in 04, 10 million in 05, and 10 million in 06. The state gave that initial $30 million. It was leveraged. Um, so the reinvestment fund matched it, actually in the end, three to one. So it turned out to be $120 million. And then they actually, in the end, also brought some additional funds to the table to get to around $190 million that they could sort of attribute to this project. The number of projects that were created was 88 projects in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and 5,000 jobs. So it could go toward a refrigerator, it could go toward fixing the outside, or it could be a massive new store being built from the ground up. But it also had the spin-off effect. The supermarket was the anchor, but there was indirect effect. In the case of Progress Plaza, a large movie theater went in across the street once, this, once the supermarket came there. New other stores, banks, um, you know, hair salons, other kinds of places that then, you know, sort of revitalize a corridor. This idea was ultimately duplicated by the national government and put in the Farm Bill, which they passed, and other states, like 17 other states, duplicated the concept that we had designed here in Pennsylvania.
Last summer in New York City alone, there were 140 farmers markets operating within the city five boroughs. That's a lot of farmers markets. Mm Owens. I'm the Chief Executive Office of Harvest Home. Harvest Home is a nonprofit located here in New York City. We've been around for seven years as a nonprofit, but for 22 years as an organization developing farmers markets in low income neighborhoods. This summer we'll be operating 19 farmers markets. We're in four of the five boroughs of the city. And we serve about 250,000 customers a year having people become ill as a result of eating bad food is putting a strain on our medical system. Most of the communities that we serve because they're low income, there's a high incidence of diabetes, hypertension, and chronic illness, the prescription for which is healthy eating. What we're really trying to achieve is in, a, in areas where there are supermarkets but the quality of produce is not good, being able to provide the residents with a place that they can go, that they can have access to the same quality of food that anyone else in, outside of their community has access to on a regular basis. Many of the customers that come to our markets are immigrants. They come from Central America, Africa, and so we've learned that by having cooking demonstrations at the market that exposes them to how to use the produce that they're um, get seeing at the market, it's a win-win for them and it's a win-win for the farmers. Right now we're in the Bronx. We're at the Mount Eden Market. This market has been here now about 15 years. Uh, it took about three years for this market to really take off. So this market is doing so well that we're now doing it two days a week. My name is Joe Mordevich. I'm a fourth generation produce farmer in the black dirt country of Orange County, New York. We operate 10 markets a week. We've been doing farm markets since 1997. Our very first farm market was with Maritza and Harvest Home Markets, a market that we still do today. It's called the Mount Eden Market. It's off of the Grand Concourse near the Bronx Lebanon Hospital. Morgavich Produce is one of the farmers, one of the farms that's been an anchor farmer at this market. I grew up with them, my children grew up with them. I know their family, they know my family. Um, they are it's three brothers that run the farm. They just rolled up your sleeves and decided to work with us and make this market what it is. In our markets, there's not a lot of cash because people are primarily on food subsidies. So that's really the engine that drives these markets. Elected officials now have started a rally around supporting the markets um, because they are seeing the benefit um, to their constituents. In 2009, the Department of Health came out with this new incentive program for SNAP that if you, for every $5 that you spend at the market with your SNAP, you will get an additional $2 coupon and that, was a, that mechanism was to promote and incentivize people really coming to the market to use their food stamps. Um, and that program has been very successful. Regardless if it's coupon or it's EBT or it's health box or it's cash, I view it all as the same. So I try to take an egalitarian stance for it because it is all the same for me. So we're hitting more areas that want quality produce and don't want to travel great distances to get it. Or they don't have supermarkets in their, in their neighborhoods. Doing farmers markets 14 years ago was not as popular as it is today. So we didn't have the level of support 14 years ago that we had to do today. So yes, everybody was skeptical because again, I'm in a low income neighborhood. We didn't expect that people would come at this, at this, at this, at this level that we have here. So we proved them wrong. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
one thing that I've noticed throughout is that people don't know how to properly feed themselves. Either at worst, they outsource it to a restaurant, or at best, they follow some fad diet advice they found in a magazine. If you're not cooking at home, it's really difficult to eat healthfully and on a budget. I mean, it's almost, you can eat on a budget if you cook at home, but to eat on a budget and to eat out, I mean, food at restaurants or to go places costs a lot of money. The Happy Kitchen started in the late 90s, and we were running farm stands at the time and in a lot of low-income neighborhoods. And kind of the idea came to somebody that, you know, we, sh we should really have a complimenting program to the farmer's market or farm stands of teaching people how to consume and how to eat and cook, you know, a lot of the vegetables. What we ultimately landed on for the free six-week series, is, and that's kind of the basis of the program, is uh, training people from the community to be facilitators, what we call them, and they're basically like peer health educators, essentially. And so there are people from the community, and um, they don't necessarily have a nutrition background or even a culinary background, but they have an interest in healthy cooking and healthy eating and serving their community. So now we have about 43 facilitators. I'm Jacqueline Broadnax. I'm a facilitator with the Sustainable Food Center, the Happy Kitchen program. I've been a facilitator in the program for nearly five years. I wanted to eat more healthy for my kids and wanted them to eat more vegetables. That's how I initially got started. We're in Texas and you know a lot of the health issues are here. I have always had uh, struggled with my weight and one of the things that I knew would change that would be if I if I started eating healthier and um, what a best that, that was a better way for me to set an example for my kids. I got into this program because my mom told me that it's an opportunity to help her cook and I think that it's really interesting because there's so many younger people and I didn't think that they would be like super interested in cooking. And I expected it to be like this serious class where people were like, okay, you need to do this, this, and this, and this, and if you do anything out of line, you're like kicked out or something. But instead it's like this really happy-go-lucky class and it's really interesting and I, I just appreciate it a lot. So I'm going to hand out a few of these salt tubes. And I just want you guys to actually read what some of these things are. Now, I don't know how many of you guys eat ham, but this is how much salt is in three ounces of ham. Wow. I don't know if you have three ounces of ham or maybe more. <laughs> I don't know if you eat that serving size. We went over how much sodium is in ramen, and I used to eat like a ramen a day. And I was a, I'm addicted to ramen, but like, it, it teaches me a lot because I know I shouldn't be eating so much sodium and I shouldn't be eating a lot of these things that are going to affect me in the future. We usually have resistance from participants, usually somewhere in the series, but usually by the end of the series, they're normally we can see a change. They look at it thinking it's about food and it ends up being about their health and being a personal journey because then they begin to realize how the sugar, the sodium, the fat affects them personally. A lot of times people will, you know, think that eating healthy is really costly. They'll spend more money on clothing or jewelry or cars instead of what they're putting in their bodies. And I think that's a lot more important. My goal with the Happy Kitchen is really to teach people how to cook, to show them that they can eat healthy on a budget and that it's not that intimidating. I think we've kind of relegated all cooking to be from star chefs or people that, um, learned cooking and it's kind of almost like you couldn't know anything about history unless you had a history degree. Hello there. How are you doing? Good. Good. I'm so glad you're here. So we're following up on the constipation and the stomach pain today. I saw you brought me your food journal. One of the most common reasons for abdominal pain in a young child is constipation, and I seem to be seeing that more and more. And a lot of that, I think, is because of the diet. So the kids are eating this kid-friendly, average American diet, which is very refined, very much a uh, fiberless sort of a diet. So, so many kids that I talk to, they don't have a bowel movement every day, and they really are um, struggling to have a bowel movement. 10 years ago, I probably would have just given these kids a laxative and 
told them, you know, good luck. But um, what I'm seeing, though, is you really aren't fixing the problem when you do that. So um, I thought, gosh, I've just got to be able to spend more time with these families, teaching them how to start from scratch in the kitchen, what to have in their kitchen, what to have in their pantry, what tools they needed to be able to cook a good meal for their families. Show me again where your belly hurts, sweetheart. Okay, right there. Feels nice and soft today, though. I hope that it is just for diet, because that's much easier to change. Yeah. And better than having to give her medicine. If we can avoid giving medicine, why not, you know? So we envisioned having this practice which incorporated a kitchen, which incorporated a teaching garden, um, and had a decor that would reflect health and wellness and inspire families. And so we opened Yum Pediatrics this year. Under one roof, you'll find my practice, but you'll also find the big teaching kitchen here um, where we teach our nonprofit classes, but also I very often will bring my patients into the kitchen and I'll show them things that we're making. We'll expose them to foods in the kitchen maybe after their, their visit with me in the pediatric side. In these big group practices, you're really forced to see so many patients. And um, I've been really surprised to see how little patients I have to see to be able to sustain a practice. And it's lovely because I can spend more time counseling on prevention. I'd rather do that than see them sick. And my goal is to have a, a practice full of kids that really don't need me that much. You know, they may come in for their well visits, but most of the time they're seeing me on this side because they're learning to cook and eat healthy. I don't really ne necessarily want to see them on that side that much. If I'm doing my job well on this side, I won't have to see them on that side as much. I just need to have a much bigger practice, I guess, to sustain this whole thing. <laughs> I am a product of an at-risk family. I know hunger far more intimately than I care to discuss. And I made a commitment years ago that no child would be hungry in, in my district. So Riverside is the 15th largest school district in the state of California. We have 43,000 students and 47 schools. We prepare 34,000 meals a day and the bulk of them come out of this facility. The experts tell us that if we do nothing, one in three children will contract diabetes in their lifetime. And if you happen to be African American, a Latino, or American Indian, it's one in two. That's unacceptable to me when by diet alone, we can change most of that. 68% of our kids come from at-risk family. And some of them get on the bus in the morning at six o'clock and don't get home until six or seven in the evening and they're going home to an uncertain future. So as a food service director, I'm most committed to ensuring that every kid has access. We can talk about innovation and creativity and uh, all of the uh, new uh, strategies for teaching kids all we want, but if we don't ensure that a child has uh, food in their body to sustain them to learn, then they're going to always be behind. So when we first went to school districts, um, we did not get a very friendly reception. Uh, that was nine years ago. Uh, but uh, I went to Riverside uh, Unified School District, and there's a guy named Rodney Taylor there, uh, who was the one who got it. So it wasn't the reception of, we already have a vendor, it was the reception of, I've been looking for somebody like you, it's about time, and it was just a great feeling for us because it was a validation of all of our hopes and dreams. Uh, and he has been uh, one of the pillars and founders of this whole Farm to School movement. Farm to School in 1997 
was the Santa Monica Malibu School District. It was uh, three farmers in South Florida and a school district in Vermont. Three. Today, it's in all 50 states in over 2,000 school districts. Two years ago, we committed to only serving fresh fruits and vegetables to children. So there's no canned fruits, there's no frozen, it's all fresh. Even on our snacks, we feature locally grown produce. Everything that we do in this school district in the nutrition program is designed around fresh food. So when you ask, how do you get kids to consume it, when that's all they've ever seen, when they come into kindergarten and all they've ever seen is fresh produce, you get used to eating it. And it's going to make a whole generation of children healthier. How do we educate the whole child? I think it's great that little Johnny is going to leave the 12th grade as a straight-A student. I think it's a tragedy if we haven't taught him to be a lifelong healthy eater. Johnny might be the smartest kid that dies of a heart attack at 35. In 2005, when we started the Farmer's Market Salad Bar here in Riverside, we had three farmers. We spent $10,000, and I told you that last year we spent $450,000 on nine farmers. Uh, when we started this, this was um, a little bit out of desperation because we really needed to find some way of improving the financials of our ranch. And so we found a few friendly school districts and I never imagined that what we were on was the cusp of this huge wave across the country that's called the local food movement. The bulk of the produce that we receive today from farmers comes through Bob Knight. Informally, he developed a hub with other farmers, they helped them sell their crops, our crops that would go to waste. And, and probably now more formally, he has a hub. And now I can call Bob, not just for his citrus or his kiwi, we call Bob for anything we want. Our customers, they don't want to have to keep track of 30 different growers and what their growing schedule is and what they grow and how available it is. So if the farmers, we can act together uh, and do all that, all the complicated stuff about crop scheduling and all that stuff, do that behind the scenes and just provide a nice, simple, clean interface to these school customers, then that makes it a win-win. And that's what a hub is. And it's basically these growers, 33 growers, working together. We share a common picking team. We share a common packing team. We share our delivery trucks. And we also share what we grow. These trees were planted like when your great-grandparents were alive, and they've been producing for years and years and years. And a little-known fact about uh, oranges is that uh, the older the tree, the smaller the orange. The older the tree, the sweeter the orange, but then it also gets smaller. And so if we tried to sell these in, like, in the global market to, to supermarkets, um, they don't want a small orange. And so in this area, in the Redlands, Riverside, Southern California area, most of the trees that we have are more than 100 years old. And so they're small oranges. And so this area was really struggling. What are we going to do with our oranges? They're so hard to sell. And so he said, well, who eats small oranges? Kids eat small oranges. So I went to a couple school districts, and I sold every single orange that we grew. And they said, yeah, we need more of this. And so I went to my neighbor and I said, do you want it in on this? And he said, yeah, sure, because we're just not making it. And so neighbor after neighbor and school district after school district, now we sell to 23 different school districts, which is about a million and a half kids. And we have 33 farmers that are part of this. So I see my job is to tell others the story of what's happening here and how it can be done in other places. Six years ago, I, I came to Claremont. The program was deemed um, unsuccessful, unparticipatory. Everything was processed. Everything came out of a can. I really wanted to get something more local. So I reached out to a farmer named Bob Knight, and he uh, guided me to um, a lot of different choices that I could get that were fresh, local, organic. It would decrease the carbon footprint, 
by you know coming from local sources, that means supporting local farmers. Uh, within 20 miles, I could basically buy 100% um, of my fruit. I'd say about half of our vegetables come from a local source within 20 miles. What's kind of special about school districts is there's one person who decides for 12,000 people or 20,000 people or even six, our biggest customer has 630,000 eaters. One person decides that. We introduce fruits, you know, melons, crab apples, kiwi fruit, things that some kids have never seen in their life, and, and it took off. We went from just under 300,000 meals a year uh, to just under 800,000 meals a year. Salad to them actually used to be iceberg lettuce, ranch dressing, and croutons. So when we introduce mixed greens, and uh, green leaf lettuces. A lot of us say, well, this is weeds and, and, and it's gonna taste terrible. Sure enough, in a very um, short amount of time, the kids took to it. When you look at school food service and you talk about the possibilities, when you talk about what can and can't be done, the limitations are here. 10 years from now, you're not gonna have these kinds of conversations uh, and we shouldn't be having them now. It shouldn't be. Uh, a big deal that we're buying locally grown food. There's definitely a need to support having access to healthy food, right, through a new supermarket with education about, you know, what it means to cook this food. It's a great opportunity to marry the nutrition education with the food access. Cooking and being well is one of the most important lessons we can teach our kids. There is no silver bullet. So kind of all of us across the city of Austin, across Texas, across the nation, we're all working on a piece of it. It doesn't take a lot of people, and they don't have to be important people. They can just be regular people to make a really big difference in a community. I'm hoping that because I'm part of this movement, I can have some sort of lasting impact. Because our ultimate goal here is to help build a more sustainable food system and having more democracy and more participation in that food system. Uh, and it's really an opportunity for all of us that all of us can participate in because all of us eat, all of us have the decision on, on what we eat and where we get it. It's not a trend, it's not a fad, it's here to stay. We're transforming food not only in schools, but we're transforming food in America. We'll let the credits roll because the filmmaker's here and it's important.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our Food Policy Seminar Series. I want to welcome you to Hunter College here in East Harlem. My name is Charles Plotkin, and I'm the uh, director of the New York City Food Policy Center here at Hunter College, and also a professor of nutrition. Um, I, you know, that was just such a wonderful film, and uh, it really, even at this stage, is, I still get chills when I see something like that. And I know so many of you that are here today are working so hard in the food movement, and I just want to say thank you as well. Today's event is hosted by Harvest Home, John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, and the New York City Food Policy Center here at Hunter College. We're excited to hear from this experienced, dedicated, and engaging panel of experts, including Leo Horgan, who's the filmmaker from John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, Adam Leibowitz from the North Star Fund and Community Fund Food Funders, Barbara Turk, Director of the Food Policy at the New York City Mayor's Office, Javier Lopez, Assistant Commissioner, Center for Health Equity at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Noreen Springsteen, said, Executive Director of Why Hunger. And I just want to, uh, before, we, before we start, I'd like to um, introduce um, Maritza Owens, the CEO of Harvest Home, who is uh, really one of the main organizers of today's event, and as well as the filmmaker and panelist, uh, Leo Harrigan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. I hope that you all enjoyed the film. At this time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Policy Center uh, for lending their auditorium to help us with the, to host the film screening. I also especially like to thank Charles and Alexina uh, for working with us so diligently to get this off the ground in such short notice. I also like to thank um, Margaret McDermott for helping us put this together, who worked tirelessly to get the word out and to promote the event and to make sure that all of you got here today. And I'd like to thank Leo for inviting me to be part of this project. Many of those who are close to me know that I'm not very comfortable being on film, both or in, uh, or in pictures. So it was a big leap for me to accept this project, but I'm really happy that I did, and I'm happy how it all turned out. Um, in the film, you would hear, you heard me talk about how um, you know, we got started and some of the things that we've been doing to address uh, access to healthy food in New York City. We started on the path basically to provide access to healthy food in low income communities. But as a result of doing that work, we have begun to identify pockets of the community that we serve that have specific needs, and so we try to develop programs to address those needs, namely our Play Street program, and more recently, we started a Healthy Senior, Healthy Shoppers program. That came out of the need that we identified the seniors who were coming to shop at our farmers markets, who also were, uh, had victims to chronic illness, were unable to come to the market and shop they were not able to access some of the incentive programs that we had available at the market. And so last fall, we received a grant from the USDA where we were able to start a Healthy Senior, Healthy Shoppers program in New York City. It's the only program right now across the state and in the city. What we're doing is we're actually allowing, providing health box, which were rebranded, to seniors who are 60 years or older and are, have a, an active SNAP account. And so if they come to the market, they're not able to shop at the market utilizing these incentives. And so this is a program that, as you probably saw the flyers on the table, we're hoping that you will take that information with you and share in your communities. It's a program that will be here for four years. But one of the goals of, the, of showing the film today is to, ident to show, share with you some of the projects, including this type of project that many organizations are doing, but to engage you and hope that you will join the, join the fight with us in helping us to figure out a way how some of these programs can become institutionalized so that when the funding is gone or when maybe Harvest Stone is no longer here or some of the organizations fall by the wayside, that these programs begin to ha have made an impact on our food system and have made changes that will be lasting as the last speaker in the, grant, in, the, in the film said, that this is something that should be, continue to happen regardless 
of where we are and what part of the country we are in. So I hope that I want to thank all of our panelists for being here, and I hope that you will all en enjoy the conversation going forward. So while we're sorting out the lighting, um, I just want to say a few things about the genesis of the project. Uh, because, well, this is sort of the shameless self-promotion part of the presentation, because we actually made this film. I, I work at something called Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, which I always say um, is more like the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Sustainable Food or Sustainable Food Systems, because that's really our, the focus of our work. And I um, uh, wanted the, the films, I, I've made a couple of these short documentary films now that are adjuncts to a, a curriculum that we came up with. It's a high school curriculum uh, that's free online for teachers, for high school teachers, and it uh, works on, it works for social, study social studies teachers, uh, science teachers, and also family and consumer science teachers. It's called Food Span. We uh, released it a couple months ago. It has 17 lesson plans, but it also has a couple of films, and this being one of them. Uh, but, you know, it became obvious pretty quickly that the, this film could have a life beyond the curriculum, too, because it's kind of a conversation starter about these issues of food insecurity. And my, my own professional background is in newspapers for 20 years, and then more recently in public health. And I think in both realms, it's, it, you know, often we have to spend a lot of time defining problems and, and also educating people about the problems. But I, I was kind of greedy, I guess. I wanted to fast forward to well, what are the solutions and, and what are people working on already out there. And, you know, you, I'm sure the kind of work that folks here do, they know about a lot of these products already. But you don't always see them in documentary films. So um, I kind of, I was very fortunate that there's a guy named Mark Winnie who works with our center who, uh, his job is a very unique one. He helps people start food policy councils all around the country. So he's uniquely kind of plugged into a lot of projects that are happening around the country that are tackling this food, food insecurity problem. And so we kind of developed a menu of options with him of some of the projects we thought were the most compelling. And we kind of whittled it down to these six that you see in the film. And so, um, you know, which is, you know, not to say there aren't tons of other projects that are very successful, but we just wanted to get, sort of get the conversation started by showing what's possible in, in some of these cases. And we obviously tried for a variety of different kinds of projects. So it's very exciting to me to, to see this, you know, become a conversation starter in New York. Um, I, I told somebody I arrived here this morning from Baltimore on the train, and I felt like a country boy already, because when I got into the train station, I had no idea how to get to my connecting uh, so. So, but um, but it's very exciting that that people are interested in the film um, in different places. We had a screening last week in Fairfax, Virginia. And people were very excited. They have a, a new food policy council there, and they had a food summit. And this was kind of a kickoff event for them. So, so I think they used the film again as a conversation starter. And I hope I, I look forward to hearing what your questions are, um, especially for our panel. And so, um, thank you all. I want to thank the panel all for being here today. I know you're all busy people, and I appreciate that you took the time to be here. So, thank you. Thank you, Leo. So, so what is the consensus? Do we want to shut the lights off? I have to let them know. Yes or no? Leave them on? You good? Okay, we're going to keep them on. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, Maritza. Um, it's really you know, great that we are able to host this today. Um, I would love to start off by, uh, Leo, you certainly just introduced yourself, but starting uh, with you, Adam, if you could just sort of introduce yourself and sort of give a... Sure. 30 seconds about yeah, yeah. what you're what you're about. Uh, hi everyone. Hi. My name is Adam Leibowitz. Uh, I am the Food and Environment Program Officer at North Star Fund, which is a community foundation here in New York City. Um, but my role at, at North Star Fund is to coordinate a network called Community Food Funders. So it is a network and affinity group of foundations, funders, and donors uh, in the tri-state area 
that are looking to transform our food system in any number of ways. Um, and so the idea of working together, sharing experiences, sharing resources, um, having events like this, bringing in speakers, things of that, uh, so that collectively we could have a greater impact than we would individually. Um, so just as you know, you, you have workers on the ground and people, you know, people on the front lines doing work, um, organizing, networking, learning from each other, we're trying to replicate that in the funder space of, uh, with philanthropic dollars. That's why. Hi. Uh, my name is Barbara Turf. I'm the Director of Food Policy for the City of New York. I work in the Mayor's Office and uh, primarily work with the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services in that, in that realm and also with the Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development. Uh, the role of my office is to organize uh, government responses um, and partnerships with other organizations outside of government to the problems of, health, of, um, of food access in New York City, which we know are related to health um, outcomes. Um, we also do a lot of work related to um, the nexus between um, uh, food and food waste, and the work that the mayor's office is doing uh, on the 80 by 50 campaign, which is 80% food reduction or waste reduction in the next 50 years. So we've got any number of things boiling and bubbling at, at any given time um, to try to solve some of these problems that some of these folks are trying to solve in their communities. Good afternoon, my name is Javier Lopez. I am the Assistant Commissioner at the Center for Health Equity, which is a division of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So my role as Assistant Commissioner is that I do have in my portfolio a food retail work, which is the Shop Healthy program. A couple of the representatives from the Bronx from that program are here. And, you know, I think that the, the opportunity for food justice is something that we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes. But for the food retail work that I have the privilege of being a part of, we have to broaden its scope. Um, we have to be more inclusive of communities that have long been wanting to be a part of that initiative. That initiative has taken many different iterations over the last six to seven years. And I think we're in a right moment now that the program has expanded to uh, Harlem and to Brooklyn, formally expanded, that we are able to really connect with the food justice leaders in those neighborhoods who can provide new access and entry points into the food retail environment. And I'm Noreen Springstead. I'm the executive director at Why Hunger. We are an international organization. We work a lot on domestic policy as well as international policy. But what our main strategy is really is looking at grassroots solutions to hunger that are rooted in social justice. So examining the deep inequities of poverty around race, economic injustice, health, and the environment and uniting all of those solutions together to build a movement for change. We've had an emergency food system for more than 40 years. It's no longer an emergency. It's a chronic problem that needs to be addressed and can be addressed in these very hopeful and inspiring ways around food. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, so for the first, first question, um, it's open to all the panelists. Food security is not only about access to healthy food in supermarkets and farmers markets. It's about other variables that impact access. The availability and affordability of healthy food, the location of healthy food, the availability and affordability of unhealthy food. Nutrition education, cooking demonstrations, cooking skills, self-worth, and the confidence to do something you would like to do, like eat and feed your children a healthy diet. What are your thoughts on this? Meaning that food security is not just about access to healthy food. And secondly, what can we do as food advocates to do more and or less to improve all of these fronts? So it's open to the panel, whoever can talk first. I'd like to just start by saying, because this is a good national moment, you know, to be thinking about this stuff. Um, and as somebody who tries to lead some of this work in the city, that we don't have, one of the problems and the challenges for all of us is that we don't have a national consensus that everybody who lives in the United States um, has a right to food and has a right to nutritious food. Um, somehow this has all been, you know, the, the narrative that we have in this, in this country and that's embedded in our history is that there are some people who are deserving and some people who are not. And so that colors everything that we try to do to change that. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping that we can work toward is a consensus that um, 
there's no, there's no shame and there's no fault. Um, and we want everybody to have that access. And we were pretty darn close to not having an emergency food system at one point. Um, and then there, the national consensus that we should have supplemental food in the form of food, food stamps and other supports fell apart. And that's where we stand today. Um, and we have, we'll have a new president in January, not on November 8th, as some people seem to be suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we'll know who the president is at that time. We'll know who, we'll know who we expect to see, and we'll, we'll, we may have a different situation in Congress, but I do think there's some very practical things where we all need to be focused um, and get more educated about how these, some of these programs are supposed to be there yeah. for people um, so that they have the dignity of cash in their pockets as opposed to other things that we can offer. Um, is, a, is the reality that was promised when a lot of these programs were, were launched. And I'm sure that you have a lot to say about this and other panelists do as well. The, Barbara makes such great points and, and that is really what, we're, the, we're talking about a narrative shift. So we've been feeding people and creating this kind of dependency model as if they're not real people. Um, and how do you change that to nourishing people, nourishing communities, <laughs> investing in communities? and creating that human rights-based framework, which is so important to believe in the dignity of every single person, the opportunities that they should have, the skills, and uh, the ability to make their own life. And when you look at the food system, up and down the food system, it's broken. People that are not getting paid fair wages, they, they're working so hard in, um, whether it's a restaurant or in the fields, and they can't feed their families. So. I think when we talk about access, it's way more than access. It's really about addressing the power shifts and the deep inequities of uh, poverty around race and all of the other issues. Uh, I would just add, um, first of all, 100% echo everything that they said. Um, and I think the other notion is about uh, control. And so say it's, it's, it's so, you know, you need to increase supply, you need to increase demand, you have to do all these other things to... Um, ultimately get to food security or food sovereignty. Um, and so the real piece to look at it is who's controlling the food system and how the food is getting into communities. And so, uh, and that's a big difficult thing for people to give up because government wants to provide solutions, philanthropy wants to provide solutions, academia wants to provide solutions. Um, and I think the, another shift that needs to happen is, is believing and understanding that communities have the solutions, they don't have the resources. And if philanthropy, if government, if academia can sacrifice their control of their own resources um, and give control to the production, distribution, consumption of food to people on the ground and on the front lines, I mean, this may be a leap of faith here, but I believe that that, then, then, then you get the wraparound effect. So it's not just providing access without any education or nutrition. It's not only providing, you know, shame and education without any access, but it's saying, you know, you're, you're empowered to solve it yourselves, and we know that you want to, and we know that you can. Where does business fall into your thinking? Um, so, much of these some of, so much of the food supply system is actually governed by profit motives, so right. it's not... Yeah, well, I mean, the, that... The, it's commerce. Right, exactly. Well, and, and I mean, there's, you, this can be solved in, Sorry, in, in, a, no, 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 in a market. Right. But, but also, to, to, to dump on her pile, right. it's also you know, this whole thing about government, <laughs> government intervention that impacts commerce, too. So there's right. a, right. That's, that but, model. Yeah, that's When we try to impose, we try to impose on commerce. But yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, obviously, if it was that simple, this, we wouldn't be having this talk today, right? Um, but, uh, you know, th I think there can be, you can have a profit-driven motive without exploitation, without um, taking advantage. And so, yes, giving up control, I guess I didn't mention um, the capitalists, or I don't know what to call it, right? Like when <laughs> well, you didn't mention big box stores, because, you know, a lot of right. people are shopping, you know, it's not that everybody goes to their neighborhood to shop. If you can get a good deal at Costco or Sam's Club, which is where abundant amounts of food stamp monies right. are spent in this country and in the city, you know, we have this idea that, oh, we need to have supermarkets everywhere, but the fact is people will go where they can get a good deal. Yes. So... And, and if the system was, I mean, 
obviously we're not starting the system from scratch, but if, if it was set up... That's a, big, that's a big important thing you just said. Yes. Okay. I guess my point was going to be that we wouldn't end at the big box store to begin with. Just to, just to get it back to the uh, original question, I think the uh, opportunity for us in public health is to do a better job of research so that we're not negating the conversation. Sometimes the research comes out, people produce a brief, best practices, evidence-based, and then it cancels out. The, uh, the lack of access, or and then it focuses on supermarket expansion, or it focuses on a smaller food retail expansion, and, and then what it does do is it, it just doesn't look at the neighborhood, it doesn't look at the micro neighborhood, it doesn't take into account that reality. So we, in the Center for Health Equity, you know, one of the things that we were pushing ourselves towards is to not allow the data and the research to negate the community conversation, the community reality, and that and that is something that in the academia as well we have to take that responsibility that our briefs, just like Coca-Cola's briefs, are spurting their movements, our briefs are negating uh, the common agenda more often. So m moving from, from there, um, there are many organizations across the country like Harvest Home that are depicted in the film um, that have been on the ground working to impact outcome. But, but what is, what's being done to help these organizations to create sustainability? Uh, what can we do as food advocates to support them? So, you know, meaning this, there are government programs or things out there. Um, there are programs starting, like like we said, Harvest Home. But what what can we do so that, you know, if you recall, Marissa, not to put you on the spot, but you were saying that you have a four-year program, and what are you going to do when that ends, right? And and um, I think that that's a pretty important question because we start a lot of these programs. There's shifts in government. There's shift in funding. Uh, what happens, and what can we do to create sustainability beyond? What's considered, you know, short-term sustainability of three or two or three or four years when the funding runs out and when the grants stop? What what happens to these programs and where do they go and how are they supposed to support themselves? It's open to the panel. <laughs> no one wants to take that. <laughs> it's a simple question. So is this where the foundation people respond? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I'll start. I'll, I'm about to put you on the spot, Adam. But what do you yeah. expect, and then what do you expect as government? Okay, sure. Sure. Um, I don't. We haven't figured it out. I mean, I think traditionally, philanthropy's answer is find other donors, find other funders, uh, get a budget line item, you know, things of that sort to create this program, and then and so that's how you have this phenomenon of the nonprofit industrial complex that people like to call it, right? Um, but at the same time, if it was able to be sustainable on its own, it would be a business. It would be, there, you know, um, and clearly there's forces at work that don't allow that to be happening currently. And so, um, I mean, I don't, that to me, I, I have no answer and I'm not ashamed to say it. That's no, that, a thousand that's dollar a, that's question. A, that's okay. You know? And I guess one of the yeah. things that maybe to throw out there and then I'll turn it to you, Barbara, is maybe there's more support around social enterprise. Maybe. You know, maybe that's and maybe there should be funding and granting to social enterprise and developing those kinds of so maybe, um, but I'm not so sure that they'll take on projects that um, aren't necessarily uh, going to lead toward a you know tremendously profitable company. And right. one of the things that I could give throw out as an example is a panel we had on urban tech agriculture, where they're only growing leafy green vegetables because it's not profitable that's to do right. otherwise. That's right. exactly right. Right. So Barbara, I'll turn turn it to you. Yeah, that's a great example, by the way, is, you know, a lot of people want to come and, you know, one of the things that happens in my office is that people come, there's three of us, and people like to come and talk to us about whatever their latest, you know, social enterprise ideas, business idea, nonprofit ideas, whatever the, whatever, they all actually need to work financially, however you think about that. Um, and none of them have shareholders as a rule. But, um, you know, even the, the number of people who have come forward lately and want to talk to me about vertical gardening or aquaponics or whatever, they're, if they want to make a profit out of their for profits, they're, they're not growing root vegetables. Um, anyway, but I digress. I'm, I'm worried now, Maritza, if, we can, if I can play with you for just a second, I'm worried are you, uh, about you because if you're going, if you're planning on not doing your business any longer, I would love to know that. Um, and we should talk about that. Um, <laughs> she is the second, I want, I want to say for everybody that may, there may be one or two people who, in this room who don't know this fact, that Maritza runs, is this, 
there are a number of different farmers market operators, meaning people who bring farmers to a single market in the city. Um, and Maritza runs the second largest farmers market network in the city, second only to Brody. We've been doing this for a really long time and has defied all the odds. Um, I also come from a nonprofit background, so have you know nothing but right. No, I'm, say more about because I think this is your question, right? No, I'm not thinking about stopping doing harvest. No, I don't think I would ever do that. I'm just trying to figure out a smarter way to do it, yeah, um, and a more efficient way to do it. And what and the question that I was trying to get to is one of the things I noticed is that a lot of these programs are addressing, like for example, the doctor was addressing medical health. The um, the person that was doing with the school district. He actually happened to have gotten a program that was got instituted nationally. And so the point that I was trying to get to see if how come some of those programs can follow that same trend? And what is it that we need to do to make that happen? So for example, we know that health bucks work. We're lucky that health bucks has gotten kind of institutional. It's become a national it, program now. It's become, yes. Exactly. So how do we do that so that some of these things last beyond, you know, the program, the government, the whatever it is that's sustaining it now, but it really becomes a part of, a, of our food system it is a that great is question. addressing the issues that we have identified and that we can put it into practice in a continuous and sustainable way across the country, not just in pockets of different areas. Thank you. Well said. And, well, and, and you know the question so well. And this is this question that keeps me up at night, to be frank. Um, and which ones could we conceivably, like for me, what what they were able to do uh, at the trust in Philadelphia and what we were able, actually, we talked about this with Marcel uh, earlier at another panel um, a few few months ago, what, what uh, Wholesome Wave was able to do with the, the match, the Health Bucks program, the fact that that went viral, if you will, and then um, with all the connections they have, they had the political chops to be able to turn that into a federal program um, the question is, what's the next thing? Like, of all these innovations, what's the next thing we could do? And what's the next thing that was invented? We're a little bit parochial here. You know, we do take pride in, in our innovation in New York City, and I think rightly so. Um, the health department having led so much of that, that um, the question is, what's the next opportunity? A lot of us are looking to the the Affordable Care Act, the the you know dis, uh, the uh, I'm sorry the DISRIP program, which is the the Medicaid uh, the Medicaid program here in New York City has done a lot of made a lot of changes, and there are several categories of activities that are you know that you can get money to do. None of them are explicitly right. food. And we, we just so you know, just as a selfless plug, yes. we do have a paper that we. That Ashley Selfless plug, up. paper on this. <laughs> Opportunities no, to get federal funding. No, really. That's what we're, we're working on. It. We're working just like Javier was talking about before. As we're yeah, trying so to this come is up where we're all like... So that CBOs can yeah. get district money that's available. Can, it seems yeah, and will the hospitals hold on to that money and start doing their own food programs, or will they pass it on to yeah. food programs? But that's another place we're looking. And the Ag Bill is up for reauthorization. And they never did do the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act last year, so we're looking at you know can we get some can we get a you know a magnification of incentives related to health into some of these programs? Can we do something on food retail because, I mean that is a national program now what they did in Philadelphia, but it's funded to the tune of I don't know maybe five million dollars nationally, and if you think about how big the Pennsylvania program was at its peak and it's only. I think we've gotten two of these grants for food retail operations in New York City. In 2015, we had two, and one went to Sobro, and I'm forgetting what the other organization was. This is the other thing. It's one thing to get the model, and then it's another thing to get it appropriated. So this is the, I mean, some of you are now really, really excited. I want to learn more about that kind of advocacy. And some of you are like, oh my god. But if you're interested in doing more federal advocacy, this is a good time to be doing it. On the sustainability question. Yeah, I, again, the, the million dollar question, but when you, to me, it's about values and priorities. So you just look at, at the federal level, the um, food and farm subsidies, millions upon billions of dollars. And then there's this wonderful little program at the USDA 
called the Community Food Project Grants that are investing in exactly what you saw on this film. And there are thousands of those um, wonderful community building, economic development, um, creating these relationships with farmers, stimulating local and regional farm economies, that there's about $5 million all together for that. If that was even just equalized, there would be a sea change. So I, I think part of the keys to the answer is building a movement. You change things, you change policy through grassroots movements with people most affected, with the leaders from grassroots organizations to, um, again, rooted in social justice to create change and to at least level the playing field. Just to have your just to echo Barbara's comments around this trip, uh, hospitals are open to the idea of repurposing their Medicaid dollars for prevention. We're working on with a couple of hospitals in Brooklyn around um, active transportation and healthy living. So there's 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 a lot of interest. Um, you just have to come with the model and present it, and you have to also be amenable to the fact that they may have their own ideas to that. You know, so there, there is a compromise to those realities that sometimes does occur. And there's also, there's also the private-public partnership aspect of, you know, thinking about long-term sustainability as well. But to be respectful of folks like Maritza and others who pride themselves on being an individual owner and a view of how the work is, I don't expect that compromise for happening. But it's, from a global perspective, there's, there's a lot more opportunities out there, I think, now than there has been. Of course, you've got to do the advocacy to the feds. You want to make sure you get the New York City delegation aware of what their role is in this, because a lot of the members, being that I used to work for a member, they are not aware of what you know their uh, what the New York City food landscape truly is, and they need some get assistance and guidance to go back to the advocacy. And, and just a word on um, on that USDA grant you mentioned, and, and because I, I I'm very just because it's been like the last week that I looked at that grant. It's very, those are very complicated grants to apply for. I mean, they're sophisticated, they're long, they're arduous. And yeah, while grassroots people are doing the work every yeah, day, but putting to... in many, many hours. Okay, well, I'm getting, I'm getting a time signal. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so let me just ask, you know, Maureen, um, <coughs> what are some of the grassroots solutions that White Hunger uses to ensure the right Nutri nutritious food to, you know, the right for nutritious food for all, and, and uh, what efforts are, are going to ensuring that these solutions are, are sustainable? We're, just in New York City, we're working with a lot of different organizations, but we do that nationally as well. So like La Finca del Sur in the Bronx, or the bed Campaign Against Hunger, um, innovations that are looking at taking a root cause analysis, um, bringing healthy food into the pantry, into the community, working with youth leaders like in uh, Bed-Stuy out at the farm in, a, in Far Rockaway. But what we're trying to do is also bring them together with other national players. So we're working with about 500 um, food banks, soup kitchens, pantries, community organizations to really create this groundswell for change. And there's a real commitment there. So part, one of our strategies or, or tactics is to uh, award micro grants and travel grants so that those local voices can participate on the national stage. Thank you. And, and Javier, this question is for you. The Center for Health Equity's mission is to work to eliminate health inequities. Uh, food plays such a big role in achieving that mission. What is, what is the center doing to ensure that those who have been historically excluded from decision making are included as part of the conversation creating solutions? Yeah, we're going to end in equity. It's, it's going to take some time, for sure. Um, but it's good to be ambitious. Uh, just just for, some, for some context, uh, for my journey in the food environment at 24, I had the pleasure of working in the same community as Adam in Hunts Point. And at that time, I didn't really understand that there was a billion-dollar industry in Hunts Point, right? Like, I didn't know that was even something that was taking place. So... Yeah, probably. Well, it's, it's different. You would have known if you come to that event. I was, I was, I was young and just like this food just comes from here. Are you serious? So, so, so then I got educated. You know, I think you know I sat down with Adam. I sat down with a lot of people in Mount, Mount Haven, St. Mary's Park. A lot of folks in the food justice movement who educated me about what inequity is as it relates to the food aspect. And not a lot of people 
take the time to understand how that impacts the communities that they serve. Then I had the pleasure of working with Maritza several years ago and seeing her operations grow from a farmer's market standpoint. So I was able to understand New York City's food layout through those experiences and come into the Center for Health Equity two years ago. One of the major pillars of our work is the fact that we're opening up our spaces to allow for community conversations to happen from a planning perspective. We've never done that before, right? So the health department is like evidence, boom, here's a program. My colleagues from the East Harlem office, Carmen, Cynthia, and Judy, they have a beautiful building on 110th Street. They also have a new, brand new Neighborhood Health Action Center on 115th Street. And those spaces are community spaces to lead planning conversations, to lead workshops, to have access points to food that just didn't exist before, maybe two or three years ago. So our commitment is really holding ourselves accountable first, second, holding our agency accountable for their ideas, and even we were on exchange last night, Barbara and I, just talking about ideas of a program coming out of City Hall, and we were working with them to say, hey, this is a way you can figure out a, the best solution for this idea. So that's simply our approach. I mean, it goes other areas. Like I said before, it's working with our existing food retail programs and saying, what are you trying to do here? Are you just placing water at eye level and apples and fruits? That's all good, but that's not changing anything. You know, that's a good initiative, and I have a lot of respect for those who designed it, but it's not getting to the root cause of why we're addressing that initiative in the very first place. It's designed as a Band-Aid solution. So our data and the, and, and the feedback loops, we will gather and not sit on a desk, but we will take it to colleagues like Barbara and others who have a little bit more cachet in this world and say, here's what we're getting on the ground. Here are the real feedback loops that you may have not been receiving over the last 10 years when we've had these neighborhood operations. So that's just one example of how we want to be different and how we lead the health equity work across the city. Do you feel like those voices are being heard? Do you personally? I, I think that there's a lot more room to be done. I mean, when you're thinking about an institutional transformation project that is the Center for Health Equity, it's going to take a couple of years for people to be even accepting of the fact that residents have solutions, right? I mean, we're in public health, and we want to say that we're there for the folks, but a lot of times we want to just problem solve for people and not listen to people. So I think there's going to be some adjustment. It's going to take some time, but the fact that our neighborhood spaces have been opened up you can't turn the blind eye anymore. You have to listen to what folks are saying because they're going to knock on your door. They're going to present their issues. They're going to present their solutions. And if you want to, you know, have a good relationship with, with those in the neighborhood, you're going to have to bring those back. And you're going to have to figure out, okay, five or six people are bringing this as an issue and they have a solution. I can't sit on this. I can't look them in the eye anymore. We've changed the discourse, I think, by opening up the doors and, say, and creating safe spaces for those conversations to take place. We're also educating our city agencies across the city to understand that health is a part of every single decision that they make. So if you're city planning, you have an impact on health. If you're a Department of Transportation, you have an impact on health. And that is the type of education that we are embarking on across every single borough because we cannot, in public health, problem solve any of these inequities on our own. These are man-made, designed um, structurally um, to prevent equitable opportunities for people of color. And if we don't call that out in those spaces, then we're not doing service to those who are really asking for those who understand the work like ourselves to be their spokespersons. So that's a shift. Thank you. That was great. Um, Barbara, this is for you. Basically, I'm interested and we're all interested to, to know what are some of the programs that we haven't heard of, the innovation, innovative programs that are coming, going to be coming uh, out of the city? I knew I was going to be asked this question. Well, it was on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I just paraphrased it. It made no, it a little different. The, <laughs> on the sheet I got, which I don't even remember where I put it. <laughs> so, so anybody here from the press? <laughs> Because I, I, you know, I have, oh, damn, that's almost See, I know you can't help yourself, but you'll always be honest. <laughs> I, I'll always be honest, uh, um, when I can. Um, first of all, uh, I want to just underline from where I sit, having Che around in, like, in our lives in government is huge. Huge. And um, uh, so that's, I just wanted to say that. Thank and thank you, and thank you to, to everyone who's here from 
the Bronx and, and, and uh, from this, the crew from East Harlem, and I don't know if there's anybody here from Central Brooklyn right now, but this is, this is, what's it? Central Harlem. Central You're right, Harlem. Central Harlem, right, sorry, I'm so sorry. I can't keep up with what's happening, so it's great. Um, so that's part one. Part two is, um, and, and related to that is, is that, because this is going to blend with my answer, I promise, is that we often, as government, will uh, come up with ideas not in consultation with people that are, that are uh, say, well, this would be a good thing to do, and then it's not the problem that people actually have. So we invent solutions for problems that don't actually exist. In the worst case scenario, right? And in the worst case, you know, because it's like, oh, because and in the worst case scenario, um, we actually create a problem that didn't exist before. So that for me is, is you know, besides the basic idea of, you know, we work for the people and, and you know, this is your tax dollars pay for our salaries and so forth. It's really more the question of, and it's respectful, it's really more the question of are we getting it right? Um, so that I just wanted to tag on to your, your wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, in terms of things that we're working on, so uh, the, the, the thing I want you to take away from this conversation, because it does relate to, I think, one of the driving questions that's behind this whole uh, presentation, is this question of how are we going to sustain this work? And go back to that a little bit and say that um, what, one of the things that we've been working on is the whole question of... Um, Javier mentioned food retail, he mentioned the Shop Healthy program. We have been trying to figure out what we need, you know, what are the problems we need to solve related to making sure that there is um, a part of access which is not about the money, because that's one part of it. Do I have money, enough money to feed my family, to provide for myself and my family after I've finished paid the, paying the rent? That is a basic New York question. So we need to work that angle. We also need to work the angle of is there I want, to, I want to provide, I want to provide good food for my family. Um, it's not that I don't, it's not that I love, you know, you should hear the conversations I sometimes get into with people um, about the misunderstandings about this. Is that food available to me in a reasonable, convenient way? Um, and we have another program besides Health Bucks. Health Bucks is something that we want to scale out. Um, the question about how would we take the current program that we have to attract supermarkets, reasonably good-sized grocery stores that have everything you need in one place, including not just healthy food, but diapers and other conveniences that one needs when one goes shopping, because time is valuable uh, to everyone in New York, no matter who you are. Um, that question is also being taken up in a fairly large way right now. Um, there's a, currently there's a program that I think many of you in this room know about called Fresh. How many of you know what Fresh is? Some do, some don't. So quickly, Fresh is a program that was put together to provide incentives to supermarkets to locate in New York City in neighborhoods that are undersupplied with good food. And um, although we are not that little town in, there's no place that's like that little town in Cody, Nebraska. <laughs> That is a food desert, people, <laughs> right? That is a food desert. That is actually what the USDA was thinking about when they started defining what a, a food desert is. So in New York, we've come up with our own set of metrics and definitions about what it means to have you know, convenient access. Our problem is density, right? We're a tall, dense city, and we don't have enough food for everybody uh, that's convenient. We have plenty of food for you, for, for everybody. Don't go away saying that the food policy director of the city of New York said there wasn't enough food. <laughs> oh my God, she said it. No, it's not true. It's just that, you know, we have a distribution problem throughout. And one of the ways we, in which we have a distribution problem is where we have retail points of sale. So we are looking at the FRESH program now. It's an incentive program. Like I said, there's a tax benefit. There's a set of zoning benefits. Some people love this program. Some people hate this program. Be that as it may, on the city council, which matters, because if we want to change it, we need the support of the city council on the zoning piece, and they're a little bit tired of talking to us about zoning right now. Do not put that on your Twitter. Um, I know how this works now. <laughs> I'm not tweeting anything. Yeah, no, I'm watching you. <laughs> but, but I think that... Um, so I think that we are going to come up with something where we expand the, the geography of the, the FRESH program and add some stuff to it 
that makes the supermarkets themselves more attractive, makes it a bit better business proposition. Because as you heard, one of the reasons that student-run supermarket works, they, the, one of the first things they discovered was, oh my gosh, there's no margin there's no, in this business. It really doesn't pay to run a supermarket too much, right? The same is true in New York City. And so, you know, these are um, virtually social enterprise businesses. And so, how do we make it less so? How do we make this a good place to run a supermarket? How do we make these neighborhoods um, conducive to locating your supermarket there is a huge problem, as a huge conversation we're having. And then there's the whole conversation about what's, what do we think the future of this, uh, that's related is, what do we think the future of this whole online shopping situation is, right? And how do we keep that from becoming, you know, the tale of two cities for food? It's like there's a group of people who can afford to have food, whether it's prepared or you prepare it like Blue Apron. How do we make that affordable for everybody in New York City? And, and by the way, just to jump in on that and parachute in on that. Please do. i am been dogging Fresh Direct, as you, I don't know if you know, to try to Welcome. take, you know, they have a, the availability to take it to, to, to go over SNAP and to take EBT. And, yeah. they, and, and they have been they did a pilot mm -hmm. with me. They did a terrible pilot in the Bronx. They did a terrible pilot in the Bronx. I'm willing to say it right out here in front of everybody. I'm going to tweet, tweet that. it whatever you I'm want. Tweet that. Because Larry doesn't uh, respond to me. Oh. So. Um, <laughs> he's talking about their intergovernmental person who used to work right. for the Parks Department. And I'm willing to fund oh, the whole exactly. program if they did something in East Harlem and they won't yeah. listen. So, so again, I hate to keep I hard, hate to keep banging on this, and I, I'll stop now. But, um, and. Uh, is that the there's an opportunity here, and it's actually in the Farm Bill, and there are online providers who are making the case that there should be a blanket provision that they can take SNAP, that it's not a waiver. Right now, you have to get a waiver, and it should be an as of right. Um, so that's something that some of you might be in interested in getting um, more educated on and involved in, Charles. Um, and all of you who know about this stuff. So there's, there are, but, but I want to say, and this is the last thing I'll say, I promise, is that without all of this energy and activity, with all, all the things that Maritza and other people who are in this room and beyond this room in New York City have done that are amazing, um, and, and all the pedestrian stuff and all the amazing organizing that's going on, we're going to be having a much different conversation about the farm bill even five years later than we did five years ago, and it's 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 to your credit. Thank you. That was great. And and Marissa, I just you know not to, not that it hasn't been said before, but what you're doing with Harvest Home, uh, you know, needs to be supported in in a, yeah. in a great in, in a great way, and um, and that's something that because if what she's doing disappears, it really stinks. So I have our, we have our first question. <laughs> oh, that was just the warm-up round? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just the warm-up round. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Janice uh, Minot. I'm with an organization, and just to clarify, we do, um, it's a not-for-profit, we do represent Central Harlem and East Harlem. We are a maternal child health organization, um, Northern Manhattan for Legal Partnership, and so as a maternal child health organization, um, you know, certainly a large part of our, um, we serve women that are pregnant and parenting. So as you know, we really um, are faced um, in terms of our, uh, our consumers with the issue of, of food and, um, and food, um, you know, food insecurity oftentimes um, for the families. So, and I guess, I, I guess, well, my first, my first uh, thought is a comment. I, I, I would like for the future and these types of panels that we um, maybe alternate with the audience with the questions. Um, so maybe that might be helpful to get some more audience feedback. Um, but my, um, you know, I certainly agree in terms of um, the, the, one of the one of the concerns um, we have, we have, and again, I think it goes to um, um, Ms. Maritza's um, um, work, is that how do we how do we um, uh, begin to sort of um, work with the models or the efforts that are successful and that are working um, rather than um, just this whole idea of constantly duplicating work and duplicating services and duplicating programs. I mean, you know, and, and, and um, I, I, I say this uh, again uh, in terms of, particularly in terms of um, 
DOH and I am I am I'm, I'm, I'm you know encouraged by the work of the, the Center for Health Equity and um, and their um, you know focus on on the communities and, and engaging communities but I but I again want to um, from a perspective of you know an organization that's been in the community for 25 years and doing work that we hopefully continue to look at how do we work with the existing programs and help to sustain them rather than the constant duplication of new programs and new people and a whole new um, sh you know shift and so I, I you know and I, and I and I'm encouraged by what I'm, what I'm hearing from Javier though he was at the listening session in, at, at, at our Harlem site um, but I do want to say that it's important in terms of um, just how do we sustain some of these great programs that are already working and, and, and providing and doing the work and that we need to um, to look at that. So, so taking on some of these that I think is really important is a duplication of programming um, and if anybody has any comments on because I think that, that was that's an important thing. And, yeah. One thing that I'm always fascinated about is, and, 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 and Barbara brought this up, the power that, that people have over government, just over government, let's say. There's never been, in the two years, and then I've worked in, in other capacities in the past, a, an opportunity where somebody from Mott Haven or somebody from Central Harlem says, I'm convening a meeting to talk about access. And I want to invite these institutions here to talk about it. I've never seen that. I've never, it, it falls in line with like, you got to go to the community board, you do this. There can be a shift very easily that in the perinatal community as an example, because I know it a little bit better, that if you guys all got together and said, you know, I really want to talk about this program that's happening, because this is working, this isn't working, and we want to reflect on it. I wouldn't, and many of my colleagues in the health department would first be a little bit like, oh, damn. But then the second part is like I kind of I want to listen I want to learn so the the opportunity to do that at least where I currently sit right there is greater but I also think there's more will for uh, new leaders who are coming into government now to be receptive to get that type of feedback it doesn't have to be quote unquote government convenes or philanthropy always convenes or academia convenes communities can convene and start holding those funders and those groups a little bit more accountable. Uh, because I think the last 25, 30 years of, of the nonprofit, you know, industrial complex has created a sense that the not-for-profits speak on behalf of the people, but the people can start speaking on behalf of the, of the outcomes of those programs a little bit more. Um, so I just say that as I think there's more opportunity and there's more receptivity from folks to attend those types of discussions. Anybody else want to respond to it about the duplication of? Because people um, don't know. People don't know that it's, that it's duplicative, right? People are like, best practices, best practices, evidence, boom, and they just keep rolling it out, and they keep rolling it out. So it's not like there's a, there's a stop, you know? People just do what they think is working because of whatever the metrics are, however they're designed. But there's room for more discussion. Thanks, other questions? Well, it's a quiet, it's a very quiet audience. I have a thousand, but I'll, we're gonna, we'll, we'll take a pass on uh, asking, okay, so we have a question right here. Uh, my name is Ray Figueroa. I wear a few hats, but uh, I'm involved in a youth farm uh, program uh, up at, uh, in the Mount Haven section of South Bronx. Also uh, oversee um, an initiative around community gardens. I'm president of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I just wanted to put a couple of uh, thoughts out there for folks. I'm really excited by the panel here. Some beautiful faces, familiar faces. I, I, I want to put it out to you all, as well as to the panel, um, access food deserts are terms I would challenge any scholar okay to research this was not invented in the communities that are impacted uh, you know when we talk about food justice that's what we talk about we talk about justice we don't talk about access we don't talk about food deserts we talk about the dignity of people being able to do for themselves in a way that is productive in a way that is um, honoring their sense of human dignity. So what am I getting at? I'm getting at that we need to really think about expanding this discourse, right? Uh, one of the things that, I'm also part of something that I'm very proud to say, it's called the Peace and Justice Collective. Um, one of the things that we, uh, that we see happening in the food access movement, if you will, in the movement to address food deserts, 
is that there's an assumption, an implicit assumption, not necessarily articulated, not necessarily explicit, but an assumption that our communities were just consumers. You know, we're, we're uh, as a result of massive unemployment, as a result of poverty, we're consumers of charity, we're consumers of government, uh, uh, of aid, um, we're just consumers in general. That is not gonna get us out of the root issue as to why we cannot get to eating correctly. You know, so one of the things that we're looking at is how do we, you know, how, at, at Peace and Justice, to be sure with the coalition, to be sure with what we're doing uh, up in the South Bronx at, at Friends of Brook Park, is meaningful engagement. Gandhi said when India was struggling for liberation from colonialism, hey, we have to weave our own cloth, using that as the vehicle by which they worked on issues of liberation. We say we have to grow our own food. We have to be the ones, Javier touched on this, I, I mean all of you touched on it actually, uh, we have to be the ones by which uh, we're engaged at every point within the value chain, within the food system, uh, uh, meaningfully engaged from an economic development perspective. In other words, that's, that's my point. So we, how do we use uh, uh, you know, this discussion around food justice to really get at and use food from an economic development perspective to hit at the root issues, which are unemployment and poverty. That was, that was great. We have to embrace that. We cannot be afraid of words and changing the narrative and uh, believing in the power of communities and the power of people most affected by poverty to create that change. And it needs to be supported. It needs to, everybody needs to stand up to it. And uh, we need a stronger voice and we need to talk about justice. So thank you. That was great. On that note, I will uh, thank all of you. Thank, thank Leo and, and Adam and Barbara and Javier and Maureen for coming today. Thank you, Maritza. Maggie, <laughs> you, did, you worked real hard. <laughs> yes, no more two o'clock emails. And, um, and Alexina, who's not here. Um, I just want to you know, thank everybody for coming. And um, we have lots of events. We have a, a New York City Community Garden Coalition Food Policy Forum uh, on Friday, November 4th. And I assume you'll be here. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're listed already. Um, and a food technology breakfast seminar on November 14th. And also the impact of pesticides on November 9th. Um, they're, both, they're all breakfast, if you can come, and they're all free. Um, I just, again, you know, Maritza, I think it's worth applauding you for everything you've done and the great job you've done. Leo for coming up from Baltimore again on the third time. Uh, and an amazing filmmaker, and that was very powerful and impactful. And uh, I don't know, I got chills, you know, after, after watching Goosebumps. And um, it was impressive. And it was nice to see some of those people that are doing such wonderful things and innovating in, in, the, in the food world, which is difficult, as we all know. So thank you so much for coming. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.